Welcome to Seniority Authority, the podcast where I track down experts to answer your questions on aging. I'm your host, Kathleen Toomey. Let's get smarter about growing older. I first met Ryan at a retreat he held for the Riverwoods Group in his role as founder of Smart Living 360, a consulting and real estate company that he founded that focuses on healthy aging and housing. His new book, Right Place, Right Time, is an excellent guide for adults who are considering a move in their next chapter. Thanks to our show sponsor, the Riverwoods Group, Northern New England's largest family of nonprofit retirement communities, where active adults find community, purpose, and peace of mind. Visit riverwoodsgroup.org. Now let's hear from today's guest. Welcome to the program, Ryan. It's thrilling to have you here. Thanks so much, Kathleen. I appreciate it. Coming to us from Austin, Texas, but experienced all over the country. I just want to start out the conversation by saying, what motivated you to live in a senior living community at the in your 20s? Did you have a hard time getting people to agree to let you in the door? Yeah, it was. It's a funny story. So yeah, at Stanford, they have something called the design school. They call it the D school. And the idea, it's all about experiencing, taking ideas and iterating on them and giving them life, but learning in real life, like how do they work? And the idea that you're developing empathy for how users engage in, with design. And so that was part of the idea was if I'm going to focus more of my life on the impact of place and people as we age, best to start off actually like living in a community. So my wife, we didn't have kids at the time, but my wife wasn't as enthusiastic about this experiment (laughs) as I was. So in the end, she opted to have me go alone. So I was working for Sunrise Senior Living at the time, this for a summer internship. And we were in DC and I went down to Atlanta to live in an independent living community called Huntcliffe Summit. And at that point, my wife said, uh, kind of sayonara, she headed back to California and I was uh, the only male and only person under 75 on my wing. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so not that I was hurting for self-confidence, but my goodness, the number of unsolicited cookies and, you know, brunch invitations. It was great. I felt pretty popular. (laughs) Tell me, just stepping even back further, most young people are designing apps to deliver beer to their dorm room and, you know, all kinds of... What made you curious about aging in your 20s with time when aging certainly hasn't been in the national conversation way back when you started. Yeah, well, I'll give you the abridged version. The unabridged version probably is best uh, over a beer. But what happened was I, uh, this is not a path I would have anticipated. And it's interesting. We have three teenagers. Our oldest is a junior and she is pretty focused right now. She wants to be a judge. And, And I think back when I was her age and I was focused on engineering and technology. And I studied electrical engineering in college and worked in Silicon Valley right afterwards, initially for an investment bank, but then worked for a startup. It went public soon after I was there. I was thinking this business thing is pretty, pretty easy. And actually it was about 20 years ago now because it had similar timeframe of uh, the Enron blow up. It's a smaller software, but public company It had some similarities and there were some unethical things that happened in the company and a handful of people went to jail. And I took a step back and it was wow. a wake up call for me. I was, what do I want to do with my life and who do I want to do it with? And it made me take a step back. And I I felt that I was really passionate about innovation. How can we do things better? But it didn't necessarily mean it had to be technology. And I wanted to do something that better integrated my brain and my heart. Where could I use my gifts and feel like I made a difference? And yeah, and I was always close to my grandparents. I was involved in a a buddy program with the assisted living community when I was in sixth grade. Our teacher had a passion about it. And so she brought our class 
over to Litton Gardens was the name of the community. And we went there once a month, but my partner, Melba Rollins, she was there just because she was, her, her main ailment was she was blind, but otherwise healthy. And, and so we really connected and we continued to meet in seventh and eighth grade when the program, the class didn't do it anymore. We just had a relationship and my grandparents were on the East coast. And so I didn't get to see them as often. So in a way she was a surrogate grandmother for me. So I think these seeds got planted. And then later on, when I had that reflection after the, the technology company, I said, well, what if maybe I should just take a bet here and a summer thinking about better understanding place and healthy aging. And, and that's really where it started. And, and that summer I walked away pretty charged because I felt that, wow, this is again, this is a bit about 15 years ago now. I felt that while senior living does a number of really good things, I walked away from that summer knowing it could be better. And when I shared what I was doing with classmates and friends of mine at uh, Stanford, they're like, what are you doing? You're what? What? <laughs> so now, ironically, more people, even classmates are now focusing on some of the opportunities related to aging. So I was probably a little ahead of my time. Certainly initially. were. But I think things are, uh, I think we're at a really good time right now. That's fantastic. As evidenced by your successful real estate company and consulting company, and you're really busy, but you took the time, in addition, the three girls, you took the time to write a book. Why write a book? On top of the family, the two companies, yeah, travel. Uh, yeah, no, great question. And to add to that, again, thinking about our kids, our daughter took the PSAT recently and I'm having flashbacks. When I took that in high school, uh, the math was fine, but the English suggested I was English as a second language. Oh, no. <laughs> So there was no hearing <laughs> in part to avoid all reading and writing. But yeah, just like Kathleen, I get a lot of questions from friends and family. What should I do? How do I, how should I think about it? And I have a brother-in-law who's a successful author and he kept needling me because he was getting questions related to aging. He's a psychologist. And I just eventually capitulated and got a um, book agent and wanted to go down that path. And this is you know well before the pandemic. And then wrote probably about a third of it before the, maybe quarter before the pandemic, the pandemic hit. And I was like, oh gosh, now I got to rewrite some of this. And then obviously the pandemic's been awful in so many ways. However, it has put this spotlight on place. And, yes. and also around the idea, a reminder that we don't live forever. So are we doing with our lives what we want to do as well? And, and so, yeah, it was really a number of small things that added up and pushed me over to then decide to, to write the book. Well, I really enjoyed the book and highlighted a number of passages. And, and what I liked about it is that it is a template for people who are considering the pros and cons of moving. And it really goes through your decision-making process. It doesn't point you in a certain direction, but it asks very poignant questions that each person should start considering. And after all your research and all your writing, I want to ask you the question that I uh, get asked often, which is the big number question, right? At what age should someone start considering a move from their original home? If they're thinking about it, at what age should they start the process of thinking? I think they should think before their kids leave. Wow. Okay. That, that's, that's part of what happened. So I wrote the book in part because spent all these years, I guess, as an insider, knowing how these different living environments are, what they're like, and wanted to use that information to share it with people that aren't necessarily as knowledgeable. But I learned a ton in the writing process because one of the things I learned is that place is actually much more significant than I thought. One of the parallels I use for people is if, you know, if we're focused on living a longer, healthier life, and you're thinking about, well, am I eating well? Am I exercising? Am I saving? Like place should just be just as high on that list. And so when you're in, um, call it your 50s, for those that do have kids as one proxy, it's earlier if you don't, at least a number of families, ours included, we, our life does tend to revolve a bit more about the kids and we would care to acknowledge because that's, are you in a good school district? And those mm -hmm. things matter for place. But once your kids get launched or shortly before they get launched, I think there's these key questions 
connections, like recognizing that life longevity is more about lifestyle than genetics. Only about 30% of our longevity is linked to longevity. So it's more about purpose and social connection and physical well-being and so on. So I think at that point, you start to ask either individually or with a partner, what do we want this life to look like? And so I think if the question is, when should we start planning or thinking about it? I really think it's that early. And then now you may not necessarily make a big change, but at least it gives you a sense of introduces the conversation in an exciting way, frankly, in an exciting, yes. way, optimistic way that says, what do we want this life to look like? And recognizing that place oftentimes is a really key platform for the life that you want to live. I think that is perfect. First of all, it's not the answer I was expecting and not the answer I've ever heard from anyone else. And I think it is spot on because of a couple of things that you just mentioned. One is it's an optimistic choice. You are choosing what you want your life to look like. So it is not a choice that is made or dictated by health or what you need. It's really what you desire. And then the second thing you brought up, which is really important, and I want to emphasize that for our listeners, is that 30%, only 30% of our longevity is dictated by our genetics. Only 30%. 70% is your lifestyle. And that does connect to place. And it does mean we have a lot of opportunity to direct our own result, direct our own life, have the life that we choose. And then I think the third point is that it's more desirable the younger you are because you have more energy. Frankly, having just made a move a couple of months ago, you have more energy to do the downsizing and the move and recover and reposition and get your new group of friends, et cetera. So I think that for those factors, this is a really dramatic and different answer, but it's a great answer. And it gives you time to think and process and discuss and read a book that lays that all out. And we didn't anticipate this, Kathleen. It's funny how life can work. We moved from uh, Baltimore, the Mid-Atlantic, to Austin about two and a half years ago. I had committed to write the book. I was outlining it at that point. I didn't realize that we were necessarily kind of eating our own dog food. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the plan, but I was, as I was writing, like, geez, this is what we're doing. Like we're making a big decision about place. It may not be the last decision about place. I think that's one of the things that I learned writing the book as well is even where the title came from, Right Place, Right Time. It means that we're best having at least a regular calibration to say, is the place that we're in truly the best place for us at a different stage in time? Most often, that doesn't mean a move's involved. Like most often, it may mean there's some tweaking. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some ways to get more involved in my community. Maybe there's some ways to reach out to friends in a way that I haven't recently. Maybe there's a way to remodel part of my house. But this calibration that another thing that I learned in writing it was there's a dual change agent happening. Like, we change, our preferences change, our health may change, our relationships may change, but also place changes. Like, let's say you've been living in your single family home for decades. You've had the same address, right? The address is literally the same, but the place around you in most cases has changed. Good Neighbors point. Changed. Yeah. You know, the metropolitan area has changed. Traffic may have changed. So just because your address hasn't changed doesn't mean that your place hasn't. So that's another element. Think about it earlier, but recognize that there's some real value in some regular calibration to see if it, you are in the best place at each time. I love that concept that, yes, you can be at the same address, but everything around you is changing. And that is true. And I also believe that the regular calibration makes sense that the more and more I talk to people, the more and more I realize that it's not a one and done conversation when you talk about any aspect of aging. It's where am I now for the next five, 10 years? And then you check it again. And you in your book came up with a tool that I think is terrific that helps you create that calibration called the Personal Healthy Aging Dashboard. And that is a just a brilliant concept. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? And you unveil it in chapter two. So it's a great 
way to crystallize what's going on in your life. Yeah, Kathleen, glad you mentioned. In fact, there's uh, something I'm going to share exciting about that particular piece in a moment. So I didn't want to write a book that was a checklist book. Like I think that there's a value in that, but there was other resources for that. I wanted to probe people to think more deeply about this decision that really matters and also help them redefine how they think about place both as a direct and indirect variable, which I think the dashboard speaks to, as well as helping people think about place, not just as the four walls, but as your neighborhood, as are you in a rural, urban, suburban area, what metropolitan area, what region of the country, what state, even what country. So make sure that we see place broadly enough and also better appreciate the ways in which it really impacts our lives. And the dashboard, I wanted to make it interactive for people. And so I have break out those five areas, which I grip out as as purpose, social connection, physical well-being, financial well-being, and then place more directly and have a set of questions there for people to really ask about. And then with these bars of kind of one to four, where do you personally think you might fit on that area? area in terms of complete full ability there, or perhaps there's uh, some gaps there. And and there's been a really strong response to that assessment tool, Kathleen. So I'm glad you raised it. I uh, I write this book, put a draft, share it with some friends and people liked it. But since the book's been out, that's what a lot of people have found to be particularly valuable. What I'm doing right now and will be available here in the next week or so on the Smart Living 360 website, we're creating a digital version of that assessment. So people can easily answer those questions and it it spits out a little graph for you with some ideas. So a way to easily engage on that because I felt that it seemed to be useful, you know, for people. Ryan, I think that's a great idea. And our listeners, when you check the show notes, you'll have links to where to buy Ryan's book as well as his website, Smarter Living 360. And we'll pinpoint where you can download that dashboard. That's terrific. You can go right from this podcast and do your dashboard. And the fact that you have ideas is a terrific way to kind of kickstart the conversation. I think that this makes a lot of sense and it is more more deep thinking book than just a simple checklist. And you mentioned at Stanford, you went to the D school and you applied design thinking, which is typically associated with tech companies like Apple and Google to the idea of senior living, which is one of the most antiquated industries. So it's ripe for innovation. And I say that being a proud member of the industry. If you're getting smarter, help us reach more minds. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts so others know we're legit. Tell your friends to follow us on social or subscribe to our newsletter at senioritytyauthority.org. Tell us more about design thinking and how that influences you and the communities that you're involved in. Yeah, so the design thinking... (laughs) It's a bit of a fancy term in a way, but it's pretty simple because a way to think about innovation. And like I shared earlier, have a hypothesis, an idea, and then build a prototype around that idea, test it out. Is it, does the real world react to it the way you had imagined? In all likelihood, not perfectly. There's things that you learn. And then what you do is you make those learnings, you alter or change your prototype and you try it all over. And that way of thinking has applications in the senior living field. It also has really important personal applications as we think about place. So I'll start with the personal application first. So one of the things that I found is that people have ideas of what they want their life to look like as they get older. Sometimes those ideas, they can be exciting, but sometimes those ideas are rooted a bit more in fantasy land than necessarily reality. And so you may have imagined, well, I'll give an example. There's a couple here, an acquaintance in the Austin area, live in our neighborhood. They're in their 60s. They had decided they wanted to, the kids had left, they wanted to downsize and they left the neighborhood. And we, we live actually pretty close to downtown. So it's only about 15 minutes away, but they wanted to be in an urban walkable environment where everything was right there. So they did that. They sold their house and moved into a condo downtown. They're really excited about it. And he could walk to his job and they could go to these nice restaurants and museums. And first like six months, I think they really enjoyed it. But they then found that they missed their friends, their friends where they were used to live and they had a hard time making new friends in the new place they were part of. And after a year or so, they said, 
I'm not so sure we made the right decision. And so they ended up then selling their condo and then buying a house back in the neighborhood they used to live in. And, wow. and so they fortunately had some resources to pull that off, but that can be an expensive mistake given the transaction costs, the moving costs, and all those things. So what they might have been better served using design thinking to say, okay, our hypothesis is we think we want to be in an urban environment, but how about we try it first? How about we maybe do an Airbnb for a week, perhaps a month? Even better, maybe we rent our house for a year and we rent an apartment or condo downtown for years. So we're, we haven't committed, but we can really see, is this what we think it is? And after that period of time, then be in a much more confident position to say, yeah, this is what we want. So I think as a really important design thinking for, for personal, in the personal domain, and in fact, that's a real key piece, I think, of the book to help people think through that on the industry side and the real estate developers and people creating these communities, we too need to use some of these principles to say, okay, well, we know some of the models need to change. How can we test some of these ideas before we decide? Side to make what can be really big bets, you know, millions, tens of millions of dollars when you decide to build a new community, for example, a renovated community. So I often work in that capacity with groups to think through how can we validate some of these ideas before we make bigger commitments. That makes so much sense. And in fact, I know a good number of couples who have done exactly what you mentioned on the personal side, where they've said, we want to be in a walkable downtown, they've moved, they've sold. And there is something in us, I don't know if it's our Americanism or whatever, that just says, we're going to make this decision and go for it, sell the home, pack up, and as opposed to a more measured approach of we'll rent our house Airbnb for six months and we'll try it downtown for six months. And I think it's good to think about that as an option for us as we get older and as there's a lot of fear with aging that you can make a decision that's not irreversible. Just think more creatively about the different ways you can play with your choices. It's Um, huge. It's huge. And even in the senior living domain, and I work with uh, some groups and, and I can see firsthand the positive impact that the right senior living community can have on an individual or couple. There's a client of mine in Seattle and and they did some consumer research with an academic university and they saw the research that came back was pretty powerful. There was one woman who said, "I've the quote was, I've lived my entire life in Seattle, but it wasn't home for me until I moved into this retirement. What, wow. I mean, wow. Powerful sentiment. However, just like any community, got to make sure it's the right thing for you. What might be perfect for one person could be the worst option for another. And and so I think in the context of senior living, I think it's important for people to really find ways to get comfortable with that fit. And I think it's important for senior living communities to make sure that people are comfortable with the fit as well. Works both ways because you know you hate to be in a situation where it's a misfit and then it's not good for them. It's not good for the community. And in some cases, is some of those decisions can be a bit irreversible. So I think it's good uh, for both sides, individual and the communities to be open about, well, how do we make sure this really is a great fit all the way around? Yes, because it's a very important decision. What do you think are the benefits of you work and create senior living communities and you've given a lot of thought to aging? Why do you think it's a benefit or why would you recommend someone move to a senior living community? What do you think the advantages are? Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned earlier that, and I did this very intentionally, I don't make any recommendations, Mm -hmm. but I'm pretty diligent about giving people the ways to think about it and the pros and cons of different approaches. But I do have a chapter dedicated, a rant really on aging in place and how I think it's an awful term. And I think the term itself makes it feel like it's something that's happening to you as opposed to you being an agent in your lived experience. And then in place feels like you're like a statue. (laughs) You're not moving. (laughs) Totally. And all the research around healthy living and aging, it's the exact opposite. It's about engagement. It's about moving. So I think that too does a disservice. But I think the biggest disservice really is, I think quite a number of people are under this presumption that aging in place or living in my single family home I've lived in for decades in the suburbs, the kind of typical example, 
is really my default strategy. And that's my plan. I'm going to do that. And then they don't really think through the complexities of that. And very importantly, this idea that there might be a better life for you in a different place. And that requires some courage, absolutely, to think that there are these exciting other doors to consider. And so I think one of the first steps is acknowledgement that potential acknowledgement that where you live currently actually isn't the best place for you. And if you get to that point, and that's again where that dashboard can be helpful, are there gaps? If there aren't gaps, then hey, you're in a great spot. But if there are gaps, then perhaps that's when okay, well, how do I fill some of these gaps? Recognizing that each of the areas I outlined are purpose, social connection, physical well-being, financial well-being, and and place. Each of those are really critical factors in healthy longevity. And so the way I see it then, Kathleen, is if you've identified where there are these gaps, for some individuals, senior living can be a great bridge for people, can be a great solution because, I mean, take social connection, for example. Suppose I have one of these archetypes in in the book where you now you have a single woman in her late seventies, place has changed around her, family's not close by, and she sees some immediate opportunities around social connection, but she also sees the benefits of having a plan for when there may be some health challenges and what does that look like? So when it works, it works. It's awesome. In fact, there was a Wall Street Journal op-ed piece came up last week with a woman writing about a community she lives in in North Carolina. And she, her point was, yeah, this actually can be a great option for people that can afford it because it's often much better than is characterized in the media, was her point. Um, Yes, it was uh, Dr. Esty. I interviewed her last week on the podcast. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, Yeah, yeah. She actually wrote a book called 80-somethings, and she wrote it at 85. Yeah, I know. So she's a pretty fantastic person. Go ahead. That's an example, right? Of uh, Yeah. Small world. That's a perfect example of someone living rich additional chapters in senior living. But again, it's not for everyone for a bunch of reasons. So a lot of it's around that fit. But when it works, it can be fantastic based on the examples we collectively shared. It, what I admire, Ryan, about what you are doing is encouraging people to think and to step back and assess their life through this dashboard and make their own decisions. Don't just live on assumptions. Don't live on, this has been my house. It's been perfect for me when I raised children. So it's going to be perfect for me forever. You chose a house, many people typically based on the school district and the size of the family and the neighborhood. And for many people, you did your job. Your kids are launched. Some of them may have boomeranged back, but eventually they will leave. And So what's next for you? And you can look at that with optimism, not as, oh, it's all over. I'm just going to cling to this home where all these things happened. There's more to life. And I absolutely love the fact that you are replacing the term aging in place with living in community. I think that is long overdue by this industry and by people in general because we are all living in some kind of community that we choose or we don't choose. And it is an act of agency. So the fact that our language that you're suggesting is now imbued with more purpose, that you're not just sitting there stuck like a statue, you are choosing to live where you're living. Even not moving is a choice. It's a choice and it's crazy. Today, they say about experts point out about 50% of kids born in developed countries like the US are expected to live to 100. So this, in fact, Stanford, their center on longevity, they launched an effort that came out with a report last week called the New Map of Life, which talks about the societal changes, even personal changes that are required to thrive over this 100-year life. And so if you're thinking of that in that way, and let's say you know your kids are gone and say you're 50, some 50s, something like that, well, you might have half of your life remaining. Exactly. If you're making your decisions based on this prior role with kids and so on, well, then you're doing yourself a disservice because it's not just another five or 10 years of living, most likely. It's a lot more. So many chapters can be part of that. And it's scary. It takes courage to take a step back in something that there is no manual. Like when we're younger, we go to elementary school and middle school and high school, and most of us launch into college. And there's like this map. 
yeah, get a career and we get jobs and we get married. There's like, there's a, there tends to be a little bit of a path generally, but when you get to midlife, there's no path. And when you look at, uh, I know we talked about this when we were together, sometimes the ageism that we face in our culture suggests that older we get, the worse life is. Yet that's not what the research points to. There's this research around the U-shaped happiness curve that shows your certain level of self-reported well-being or happiness in your 20s. And then you work your way down a negative slope until your late 40s, early 50s. And I, I joke, I think it tends to have a correlation to having teenagers in the house. <laughs> and then it starts to pick up. And so in your 70s and 80s, people report being happier than they were in their 20s. Now, nothing in our media would suggest that that's the narrative, but I do think that that's part of it, imagining what do you want this longer life to look like and recognizing that place is like this really foundational piece in realizing what that vision looks like. But I do want to say it is hard. You have to give yourself the permission. I have a friend of mine that read an earlier draft of the book, and I think he said it nicely. I want to grab a big glass of wine. And, just <laughs> think. and your book gave me permission to do that. Just think, mm -hmm. oh, I want this. And he had recently gone through a divorce. And so there are a number of things for him that were new variables and what does he want it to look like? And, and so, I think that's part of it, but also it takes courage to do something too. It takes courage to do that. I know it's hard if you're part of a relationship or individually moving. I know it sounds like you've moved recently and we did a couple of years ago and it's not easy. So you have to make sure it's the right decision, but then summon the energy and, and courage and emotion to go do that. So I by no means am suggesting these are like easy things to think about and, and easy to act on. But what I do feel strongly about is it matters, mm. it really matters. And for the things that really matter, they deserve that level of attention and consideration. And you don't don't let people off the hook. You are not prescriptive in this book. You are not saying, if you're this and this, do this. If you're this and that, do that. And it is truly a thinker's and planner's book. And it is a kind of book where you could, I could easily see a book group of a certain age of people having conversations around this. Are you and your partner having conversations, picking it up, putting it down, checking the dashboard? It is thought provoking. And it's optimistic because you're exactly right. It's the same line that I used years ago in this little TEDx thing that I did, which is my parents are 88, both 88, and there's no roadmap for how they are living. They did not expect to be this old. They expected to die in their 60s. And so it's unexpected for them. They didn't plan to live this way. They don't, a lot of what they are living with, they're not happy about. But we are different. This generation of adults who are the boomers, you know, we've changed everything, changed every social convention. And now we have the opportunity to live much, much longer. So we have the responsibility of being thoughtful about it and responsibility to opportunity to redefine how all of this time is going to be spent. And I found Kathleen in writing it and then the response to it has been, it hits a number of generations because you know, in your example, let's say place is a factor in your life and place is a factor in your parents' lives. And I wrote the book in a way that could be helpful for people making their own decisions say in their 80s and, and their kids, but also as a potential conversation piece mm. across generations. And now we're in the holidays. It's a time when we tend to see some family and there could be some questions about it. One area that I have found, I mentioned this a bit in the book, is that sometimes there's a tendency to know what's best for mom and dad. <laughs> And almost like when they no knew, no <laughs> then, you know when, and when they knew what was that would never <laughs> happen never happen and so this element of personal agency of allowing people to make the decision that they wish to do even if you feel as an adult child it may not be the best decision there's some wisdom in making sure that people are fully aware of the pros and cons of a path they're going down but honoring that decision. And of course, it's different if you have situations perhaps where there's dementia or Alzheimer's and that's a different situation. But when people are of sound mind, it, it may be that the term that we both uh, despise around aging in place, but it may be that aging in place 
maybe it's not objectively the wisest thing, but maybe that really is what a loved one wants to do and they're educated on it and you just have to grin and bear it. I have a couple of friends where that's the situation right now, where that really is what their mom would like to do and they're honoring that. So my brother-in-law is a psychologist. He can speak better to some of those angles, but I know they're real and this isn't a logical, you must do this. There's some nuances in it, but the more that we can appreciate that it matters and that we take agency in our decisions, I think that leads the best outcome. Because I've heard stories, I'm sure you have too, where people feel like they got placed, they got put in mm-hmm. senior living and or other environments and rarely is a, a happy resident. Yes. And we have a saying here that everyone has a right to make a bad decision unless it endangers them or their fellow residents. And, and I think that's true with dealing with parents is they finally launched you as a child and let you make your own life. And this is their life. And you could argue till you're blue in the face, not that I'm speaking from personal experience. Um, And you could be very knowledgeable about senior living, not that I'm speaking from personal experience, and they could take none of your advice. So you have to respect that and support the decision that they're making. Because that is agency for them is saying, I understand what you're saying. That is not my choice. So I think you let it go and you support them and it can motivate you to think more deeply about choices that you're going to make when you're older and how open minded are you going to be? Because it's important to be intentional Totally. in these decisions. I uh, actually hired my daughter as the primary editor for the book. And so it's been fun to have these conversations with someone who's 16 in her teens around this. She, she jokes, she's like, she's like, dad, I know far more about healthy aging than a 16 year old should, (laughs) but you'll see it play out over time. I mean, you know, you'll have her agency and we'll have ours. And anyway, it's hard sometimes when you think, you know, what's best and maybe you do, but it's not how life really should work. You may know what's best, but best isn't necessarily what that other person wants. But you are really ahead of the game talking about aging to a 16-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> He's great. Not always grateful about some of She's great. <laughs> well, tell me when she's ready for an internship because we'll <laughs> ship her up here. <laughs> Anyone named Adelaide is someone I want to work with. I have another question relating to the pandemic, and I want your thoughts on this. Why is loneliness the biggest epidemic among older adults? And we are talking about people making their own choices, but I think one of the biggest issues that is a lifestyle factor is loneliness. And tell us why that is now at epidemic proportions. Well, so this matter of loneliness was a very big deal prior to the pandemic. There was a study several years ago by Cigna where they found the two like loneliest groups in the US were kind of old, old, so people called 80 plus, and then sadly, college students. Wow. And it spoke a little bit to just the dynamic that technology has had in our society. The fact that we're busy running around, I'm not sure what we're doing, but running around. And so it's impacted this social fabric in a lot of our societies. And you're seeing a number of sociologists write about this. There's a, a longer article, actually a lead article that I recommend. It was February 2020. So just before the pandemic started is literally a lead article in the Atlantic Monthly. And the article was, yeah. The, I read uh, that. Why, exactly. Why the nuclear family was a mistake. And, and yes, these different dimensions here that have pulled us away. And there's some other research recently where there are now five times as fewer, there's five times as many people, men, for example, don't have what they would consider a close friend outside of family. And there's three times fewer fewer men that have what they would say at least 10 close friends outside of family. So it's happened gradually, Kathleen, there's experts that can speak to that evolution, but we've reached a point where, and actually an important dimension here on loneliness, loneliness is subjective. Mm -hmm. Be around a lot of people and be lonely, and you can be around no one and be lonely. This idea of social isolation, which is that's actually objective. How many people do you regularly interface with? But but loneliness is quite complicated. But the reality is that a lot of people do feel lonely, and a fewer of us know our neighbors. And the impact to our health, this statistic's been widely shared the last several years that people that are feel regular sense of loneliness, it has the health equivalent of having 15 cigarettes a day. Uh, Wow. And so what ends up happening is 
it oftentimes lo- there's no easy solution for loneliness. In fact, loneliness in some ways is actually a good thing because it's a trigger that says, okay, I'm feeling a certain way that's not good. How can I change it? And so that is, I do hope that's one of the possibilities in our society. If we can be more aware of that loneliness trigger, and that can actually prompt us to say, okay, well, what are my other options? Which is one of the reasons going about the dashboard, that social connection piece, you know, is valuable to work through. And I think that this is going to be a very good way for people to do their own sense of measurement because we think a lot and talk a lot about health and weight and body and BMI, but I think we should start having more intentional conversations about how to connect with people and how to break down that social isolation. Before we, this has been so exciting, but before we leave, I have just one final question. We haven't touched a lot on the new trends in senior living, and there's a lot going on, and you're at the center of much of that with Smart Living 360. Is there one trend that you'd like to mention or would like to share with our listeners as a something they may not be thinking about that's an innovation that's coming down the road? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say one of the things with the pandemic, and you may have heard this, in some ways it's accelerated the future. And so what happened with the pandemic, we got to see the reality of possibility of more goods and services coming to us. And that was in the form of meals. It was in the form of stuff. It was the form of telehealth. And so I think you're going to see now increasingly is you don't necessarily have to go to a place for, and again, the context of senior living, go to a place that has healthcare necessarily. I think we're going to see more and more, you can be in a place that you want to be in and then have technology and services come to you to make that work. Now, we talked about aging in place before. Some cases, you might be socially isolated and lonely in a certain spot. So that's not right for other measures. But this idea that we historically had to move to where care was, I think you're going to see more and more pressure on that model. Mm -hmm. People can be in settings that they prefer. And then with a combination of technology and service delivery and things like telehealth, be able to be in places you prefer longer than we have historically. So I think that's actually going to create a lot of disruption in and how the healthcare piece of what's senior living does today, how that changes. And I think it'll also empower consumers to say, wait a second, I don't necessarily have to make a commitment to certain things if I know the service delivery model around me is going to be changing. That's exciting. So the disaggregation of some of this and being more person-centered, being I want things delivered to me when I want them, the way I want them. That's certainly good news for boomers <laughs> because that's what they like is to have things done their way. So that's exciting. Ryan, this has been such a thoughtful conversation and a very hopeful one too. And I know that a lot of our listeners are going to benefit from this and benefit from reading your book and taking the personal dashboard. So if you are listening, check our show notes for the link to Smart Living 360 and the dashboard and run right out and get Ryan Frederick's book, his new book, Right Place, Right Time. Start those conversations with your friends. Thank you so much for the time you spent with us today. Kathleen, my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. So that's our show for today. If you enjoyed it, please tell your friends about us so we can reach more minds. Give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and send in your questions on aging. Until next time, enjoy the chance to get smarter about growing older. Thanks to our show sponsor, The Riverwoods Group, Northern New England's largest family of nonprofit retirement communities where active adults find community, purpose, and peace of mind. Visit riverwoodsgroup.org. That's our show for today. Did it spark a question? If so, send us your questions at senioritythority.org and we'll track down the answer. Meanwhile, don't forget to subscribe, like us on Facebook, follow us on YouTube, and rate us on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, let's get smarter about growing older.